Hello and welcome to the Folklore Podcast. I'm Mark Norman, folklore researcher and author. In this episode of the podcast, we're going to be exploring what is a quite broad subject, but through a far more narrow and somewhat more unusual lens. The broad subject is witches and the supernatural, and the narrow lens is their particular representations on the 17th century musical stage. This is the story of witches in the opera. Joining me to discuss her unique research into this particular field is musicologist Shauna Caffrey. Shauna completed her undergraduate studies in music at Trinity College in Dublin, where she was awarded the Mahaffey Memorial Prize this year for her original research into the origins and appearance of witchcraft in Purcell's opera Dido and Aeneas. She is currently expanding on this research to take a much wider look at the 17th century musical stage across Europe and how witches and the supernatural were portrayed at this time. I hope you find this an interesting interview exploring a rather unusual aspect of folklore research. Folklore, the beliefs, traditions and culture of the people. Passed on in the most part through the spoken word, folklore expresses our values, our shared ideas with others. It is both how we were and how we are. Without a record, our customs and traditions may become lost to us in the present, but under the surface, we still draw on them. We still know. It's time to recall our forgotten history, and to record the new. This is the Folklore Podcast. Welcome, Shauna, to the Folklore Podcast. Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, we first met uh, a year or so ago at the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic when you um, came to see the show Witch, which we've talked about on the podcast before. And it's taken this long for us to get to this stage of actually getting to do an interview. So it's really good yeah. to have you here. Yeah, research can be like that. I can't believe it's been over a year. And uh, well done, I believe the show's been doing very well. It has, it has. And it's lovely to have you on it. Now, you are primarily a musicologist, yet your master's is uh, in music and cultural history. So tell us a little bit about how these two fit together and, and how folklore fits into this for you. Well, it's one thing that I, I do feel very strongly about is that music and musicology as an academic field um, has harboured an awful lot of connotations about it being quite self-contained and concerned solely about um, music and notated music at that. Uh, so it's something that I feel that music is something, it, it isn't something that uh, is contained only in a written tradition, but it's also something that does intersect with other aspects of our lives. Like, any of us have had the experience of it engaging with music on a day-to-day -day basis. We all have the experience of going out and seeing live music. It's not something that lives uh, in an isolated existence. It's something that engages with other aspects of society. So from my own perspective, studying music and cultural history together um, is, I think, one of the best opportunities that I've had to get a better grasp of what music is in a performance in a kind of performance aspect to it, but also in how it is actually shaped by what's going on in the human environment. And as far as folklore, my own interest in folklore as a musicologist comes from um, something of my, I think you could, say, you could say something of my own cultural background. Um, if the accent wasn't a dead giveaway, I am from Ireland and uh, we do have a very strong folkloric tradition over here, um, which from a very young age I was exposed to uh, by family. My grandmother was Shanaki, which is the 
uh, Irish word for uh, an oral storyteller. So I grew up with a kind of healthy diet of mythology and folklore growing up. And so um, when I had started studying music, it was something I kind of put to the side. And when I had started working on musicology specifically as a specialism within my undergraduate degree, it uh, became apparent to me that there were definitely some intersections that uh, I can, would be both useful, but also very interesting in terms of the potential for research. So that's how I got working on it, really. I'm glad you mentioned that, actually. That that storytelling aspect is really interesting because I guess that's probably the first thing that people would think about when they think about um, music within folklore is kind of folk song and, and possibly storytelling through that. Um, now, the previous guest to you, of course, on the podcast, John Buckridge is a storyteller and is one of the things that he particularly does is is use these uh, not necessarily traditional tunes, but folk songs uh, as a way of telling stories. So, yeah, that's the most common thing that people would think about when you look at music and folklore. But you're looking at something slightly different and you're looking at um, representations within opera. Now, this is not a field that we would immediately go, oh, folklore and music. Yeah, opera, that's a big thing there. So why did you take that route? uh, And what exactly is it that you're looking at? Um, so what I'm looking at at the moment is uh, quite quite a well I say quite a broad survey as my own particular area of interest is concerned with opera in the 17th century and the relationship of witchcraft and the supernatural with opera in that period so um, one of the interesting things as you say of when people think about folklore and music the for one thing your immediate reaction is probably what do you mean? But the follow-up is probably people begin to discuss folk song. Um, But as I've said, uh, music in all of its forms is something that uh, is quite pervasive. It gets into a lot of different aspects of our lives and it's not a one-way street. Uh, Folklore has very much the same effect. So what I found is quite interesting, opera is normally seen as this... um, I loathe to use the term high culture. I don't necessarily like the term, but it's generally regarded as being a a more elite um, aristocratic genre of music that isn't really necessarily related to the realms of folklore or mythology in any kind of concrete way. Um, so for me, seeing how the two intersected was quite interesting because, of course, at the time... Um, that I'm particularly looking at being the 17th century witchcraft belief or belief in the supernatural was uh, it was very different to what it is now. There was much less scepticism regarding the subject and it was much more a part of people's everyday lives. And that was something that extended right up to, um, you know, right up the political hierarchy, right up into court into legal systems um, so of course it also made its way into opera and into poetry, into any kind of theatrical works, which at the time uh, was something of a kind of favourite uh, theatrical topic. So which uh, opera are you looking at particularly at the moment and uh, and why is that of interest to you? Uh, so my the primary opera that I'm looking at is it's Henry Purcell's Dido and Daenerys. So it was something that became apparent to me while I was examining it we looked at the opera during my undergraduate studies and studied quite a lot of Purcell's work as part of restoration music and particularly restoration theatre music um, which is to be honest I'd say probably the most well known of his output um, in addition to his church music Um, but what I found quite interesting was for one thing the music of Dido and Aeneas I think it's incredibly beautiful Um, but also I thought that the drama was quite uh, quite an interesting one. So the tale of Dido and Aeneas is uh, formed on the basis of Aeneid Book 4. Um, but it was actually the version that we have uh, in the opera was written by Nahum Tate and in turn inspired by a number of different, trans- potentially by a number of different translations um, that were made during the 17th century. So the tale follows uh, the relationship of Dido, who is the queen and reputed founder of the city of Carthage, and uh, Aeneas, who was at the time a dispossessed Trojan prince, uh, who was foretold by the gods to be the founder of Rome. So 
Dido, having unfortunately previously lost her husband, Sichaeus, um, is quite resistant to the charms of her guest, but is urged by her sister to uh, pursue a romantic relationship with him. Now, I will note at this point that the sister is what the sister's name is varies from edition to edition of the opera and in translations it's sometimes Belinda other times it's Anna um, and she does play quite a key role as a um, kind of as not not quite as a narrator but she draw, she's kind of a driving force in the opera herself um, so the pair appeal to uh, Basically, in the end, her appeals are fulfilled and Dido and Aeneas take up a, a romantic union. But their, uh, but I don't know if tryst is quite the right word, but their happiness is somewhat shattered by the appearance of a group of witches who, uh, in a particular space on stage, it's something I'll, I'll probably speak about a little bit later in a bit more detail, but the witches occupy quite an interesting space on stage, uh, and in this space uh, perform a series of rites and summon a a, um, a spirit in the for- who they command to take the form of Mercury to go as an emissary to Aeneas to tell him that he must leave Carthage and take with him uh, all of his men. Um, and leave Dido so that he can go and follow his destiny as the founder of Rome. Now, the interesting thing, and this is what piqued my interest personally, is that in the Aeneid, there is no such no such occurrence. There is uh, no sorceress. There is no summoned uh, sprite in the form of Mercury. It's simply a case that the gods intervene themselves and send Aeneas on his way. So for me, it was something that was quite interesting. Was when they have the you have the appearance first of a single sorceress, and then her kind of sister figures appear. And I thought, for one thing, it was very similar in my mind to the appearance of the weird sisters in Macbeth um, and also quite similar in terms of the space on stage that they occupy um, so in the end uh, as it happens the witches are triumphant uh, Aeneas is entirely fooled by their uh, little their little uh, emissary and goes on his way um, weighs anchor, anchors with his men and sails off to follow his destiny and found Rome which that's the end of we and we hear, the last we hear of it rather in his uh, as far as Aeneas is concerned. But um, perhaps the most well known scene of the opera is what follows, which is Dido uh, now having been abandoned uh, by her lover is inconsolable and commits suicide, uh, singing this fantastic and rather well known aria. That's just it's most often known as Dido's Lament. Um, in which she appeals to seemingly her audience uh, that they should remember her but forget her fate. Um, And so the witches, these kind of malevolent forces, have uh, succeeded, so we see, in Tate's uh, Tate's libretto. But it's uh, as to what exactly their motivations are, we're never told. They simply appear out of nowhere and disappear uh, just as suddenly afterwards. There's no... uh, no kind of triumphant after postlude the opera ends on quite a tragic note and um that's something that i was quite interested in was this you know quite bizarre appearance of the witches inserted into a classical narrative where they you know the the ending of the story in the aeneid is exactly the same it's for all intents and purposes the witches are substituted in in the place of divine intervention so there's a very strong relationship uh, in this case between the music and the characters of the witches. Can we take that further? Uh, is is there a relationship particularly between witchcraft as, as a, a theme and opera generally? Um, yes, it is actually quite interesting. And this is something I'm hoping to expand into in my own studies. Is um, Dido and Aeneas is something of a... a um, I believe it was described once as Purcell's freak opera, um, because opera at the time on the British stage wasn't terribly common. It was more, um, there were the appearance of uh, restoration spectaculars were more uh, more popular, and also there was still quite a strong tradition of masks. Um, 
so that's what was going on really during the period that was more common so to have an entirely sung opera particularly in the English language was quite rare um, however on the continent opera was still very much in uh, it was in somewhat of its in it, kind of its early days we are really speaking about early opera at this time so it was something more of an emerging genre than the fully established uh, thing that it is now but the witch or the figure of the sorceress is also quite prolific on the French stage during the period so and two notable examples would be um, Medea from Charpentier's Medea and uh, Armide from the opera of the same name by uh, Jean-Baptiste Sully, um, both of whom are quite different but share some similarities to the witches that we see in Purcell's opera. Now, the, big, um, the main difference being that they have a, a very very clear-cut classical origin. In the case of um, Medea, it's from Euripides Medea and based on the myths that precede that as well. And in the case of Armide, it's from uh, the character of Armide is taken from Torquato Tasso's uh, The Liberation of Jerusalem, which was if an epic poem that told a fictional account of the events of the First Crusade. Um, so both of those ha- are depicted in a slightly different uh, manner to the uh, the witches in personal style on air so what we tend to see is we have a much more um it's much the depictions are much more colored by classical mythology than they are by any semblance of folklore which is the case in uh in Diodor and Aeneas. there is in from what i can tell in my own research there's definitely um there's a, a very strong folkloric influence in how they're depicted and also in their mannerisms and how potentially in how they were performed um but certainly there's a very strong uh, native influence with Stido and Aeneas rather than being solely uh, the result of a classical mythology so this this more folkloric aspect um we'll come back to in a little bit but but before we talk about that is that the reason that you chose to focus primarily on this opera other than others that were available as you've just discussed with with similar themes yeah now in the there is no to be honest it's not to say that i have a limited uh not to say that my interest is in any way limited to just this this one opera at the moment uh that's been this has been the opera that i focused the majority of my research on up to this point i am currently in the process of branching out hopefully over the course of my master's and in further studies um i'll be doing a basically the the entire i'll be looking at it over the entirety of the 17th century stage in europe and so i'll hopefully be finding different uh, appearances of the witch in opera and in different theatrical music across europe and looking at them within their own traditions and seeing what the uh what the folkloric and mythic influences are uh, in those cases with dido and aeneas that was it was uh like i said the primary interest was more so their the fact that there were witches there at all um, was something that I had found quite interesting, given that, the, as I've said, the Aeneid um, doesn't feature witches in quite the same way that we see them in Purcell's opera. Um, there are um, certain figures that we can discuss a little bit later that are somewhat similar, but there is a very there's a, a distinct difference um, in how we see them in within uh, Dido and Aeneas themselves. Uh, there's something of a composite uh, kind of figure. They're not purely folkloric, but there are certainly allusions to um, similar priestess figures in the Aeneid. Um, so I think they are they are very much the child of classical mythology and uh, and British folklore. But I do think they're, they're in in that in that kind of synthesis, they are their own their own interesting little entity in themselves and that was something that I found to be very very interesting to pursue in terms of study was finding what parts well, I was about to say what parts of them came from where so it might be uh, an oversimplification but I do think that the different cultural influences in their depiction um, are they're they're definitely there to be found they're there to be there to be dug up and interrogated and interrogating them was something I enjoy doing quite a lot um Okay, so that so that leads you to focus on Dido and Aeneas, and the fact that there are witches in there at all is something that piques your interest. Uh, so, where do they come from, these witches? Yeah, now this is my this was the area that what well, actually took up the majority of my study last year was trying to uncover what the origins of these witch figures are, and it was something that took me um, very much into 
a very interesting area of musicology. As I've said, a lot of uh, within the discipline of musicology, a lot of people have the idea that it's very, very deeply ingrained with musical theory and working with scores. As I said, I spent more time working on various uh, translations of the Aeneid than I did on scores a lot of the time uh, while I was working, while I was researching this. Um, so what I found was um, in examining the Aeneid, as I say, there was no no witch in the sense that we would think of the witch. Of, of course, we have, um, when we discuss the witch now in the 21st century, we have these kind of romanticized notions of, uh, you know, haggard women living in quaint cottages with bubbling cauldrons which isn't necessarily always the case um but which is an image that's very much founded in 17th in the 17th century um but what i found examining the aeneid was that there was a very specific image and character that uh, be, that turns up at various points so in the 17th in 17th century england the fourth book of the Aeneid, which is the book that this opera is based off, uh, was quite a popular subject for uh, translation. So I examined a number of different one, different translations from between the 1620s uh, right up to the 1670s. Um, and each of them presented a slightly different image of uh, what Virgil was saying. Of course, translation at the time wasn't necessarily as concerned with um, linguistic precision, shall we say, and in some cases was more concerned with a, I think poetic license might be the correct term that I'm looking for here. So it was a case that it was the effect that was achieved uh, in the translation took precedence over the uh, the how precise it was. So one of the earliest translations that I found was called Dido's Death, which is dates to around uh 1622 i believe yeah and um in dido's death we see that dido at one point following her abandonment by aeneas uh tells her sister that she has been advised to gather any of aeneas's uh belongings and ceremonially destroy them in order to purge herself of any of her um more persistent feelings for her and her grief at having lost him um so in this translation, Dido's death, um, she tells her sister that she has been advised this by a massile she-priest. Uh, in a later uh, edition by uh, the translators Waller and Godolphin, and from 1679, she describes this figure as a magic prophetess. Um, so as you can see, there's slight difference in the translation there, but there is uh, this particular knowledgeable female character of a somewhat magical persuasion. Um she is in uh, in Dryden's translation, which was later again. She was identified as a priestess, which is I, I think the best term, the most fitting term, uh, in terms of modern language. It's arguable that the this figure is presented by Dido as an excuse uh, at this point in the narrative of Book Four of the Aeneid. Dido is. Um, this is prior to her own suicide, but the suggestion there is the suggestion that Dido may be using the uh, this fictitious priestess character uh, to excuse herself as she builds her own funeral pyre out of Aeneas's uh, weapons and armor. Uh, alternatively, there are the interpretations that this is a literal priestess that is consulted by Dido and who is present during uh, Dido's preparations for her own suicide. Um, so there are some absolutely fantastic descriptions of uh, in these period translations uh, of this uh, this priestess, and she was attributed with a series of rather fantastic powers. She was told that it was told that she could raise ghosts, uh, halt the course of rivers, and turn back stars in the sky. And I'm going to see. I think I have a quote here from uh, a vicar's tra vicar's translation which was, I'll try and see, which was in 1632, uh, which was uh, that she stops swift streams, the stars above turns retrogrades, and nightly ghosts can raise to make the ground groan with strange amaze. To trees run downhill, she frights and frays. And I think that's an absolutely beautiful passage, but it's also one uh, that is very in keeping with 17th century British images of what witches were in folklore and um, these notions of 
uh, kind of very natural imagery uh, of the raising of ghosts and um, this kind of supernatural thing was it wasn't necessarily a foreign uh, idea to the British audience um, which I think is part of the reason that they were described in such terms a lot of modern translations um, don't include passages like this at all they would describe this figure in if at all it's um, a kind of much more clear cut definition in, in um, some modern translations she is as I say she is depicted as um, a character that Dido has created to use as an excuse to create the funeral pyre yeah you're right aren't you these uh, these these are um these are themes or, or uh, characters that that are very common in british folklore at the time certainly so you can see where the influences come from uh, and it's quite interesting actually when as you're talking about this i i kind of have in the back of my mind um the fact that these kinds of characters actually are are quite pervasive in this sort of thing generally because I was just randomly thinking of something like Disney's The Little Mermaid, for example, and their and their use of a similar character in using Ursula uh, as as a sorceress and as a, a villain in what is another strong but completely different folkloric tale, but still drawing on that kind of sorceress um, trope, if you like. Oh, absolutely, and I think it is something that is incredibly culturally pervasive. Like, I mean, one need only think, like, even now, when one, if you're to speak to anyone about witchcraft, we, there is immediately you have about, you know, in most cases, and numerous examples of popular culture in which the witch is quite prevalent. I know, in terms of recent examples, you know, the right, the Harry Potter books would be one such example of you know, piquing an interest in younger children of witchcraft as not necessarily where the, in which the witch is a boogeyman in which the witch can actually be uh, a figure of a heroine uh, or even just a character who is relatable rather than a character that's to be feared. Now, admittedly, um, in Dido and Aeneas, the witch is very much uh, in the latter category. They are um, very much an antagonist to uh, Dido and to Aeneas um, but as I say, it's something that I'm quite. I, I think it is quite interesting, and in have in in uh, witchcraft scholarship in general is looking at how the witch is culturally received from 17th century to now. Because even the even common Im imagery, particularly at this time of year, it being so close to Halloween, um, images of you know this witches in pointy hats on broomsticks. Um, it's such a strong and culturally ingrained image. It's instantly familiar to people across the world but it has itself got elements elements of that image or, or like originate uh within the 17th century yes absolutely they do don't they now you you were suggesting earlier on that um that the witches are possibly not the only folkloric figures that feature in dido and aeneas so so what other folkloric elements are we seeing and do we see similar things in other 17th century operatic work as well oh of course um the supernatural were something of and i think this is the which is are symptomatic of this um the supernatural was something that utterly captivated the 17th century audience um both in england and further afield on in mainland europe um so in the case of um France and Italy, you had, um, as I've mentioned before, the examples of Armide Medea, but um, stemming from uh, continental opera, you had a very strong trend in uh, stage machinery. What When we discuss it in terms of French opera, we generally refer to it as the merveilleux which is just simply the marvellous, um, in that there were such, uh, as, you know, the kind of uh, theatrical um, effects that we would now take for granted that were pioneered during the 17th century had you know fantastic stage machinery that allowed for moving backdrops and things like that that were entirely new to the 17th century audience and writing in supernatural characters whether they were witches or other folkloric figures uh, gave the opportunity to deploy these uh, machines to you know utterly astound your audience and um, so it was wasn't it was if anything, I'd say it was less common to have an opera without this, a supernatural element than it was to have one uh, with them. So um, in the case of 
Continental Opera, the Furies, uh, tend to make quite frequent appearances alongside sorceress figures. That tend, they kind of, not quite, I wouldn't say a sidekick role, but uh, the Furies would be summoned uh, uh, generally to... Uh, we can assume, we, we can presume some kind of uh, shock and horror to their by their audience. Uh, it wasn't uncommon for sorcerous characters to uh, summon furies uh, to exact revenge, uh, as in the case of Medea or in the case of Armide. Um, as far as Dido and Aeneas go, as I've mentioned before, the uh, sorceress and her uh, witch companions summon a spirit basically is just kind of referred to as a spirit um in the guise of mercury um and there is also reference to the furies towards the end of the first act of the opera and although they're not witches themselves they're quite they are representative of a similar supernatural force um and so they are obviously um, a direct reference to a classical tradition again um and occupy something of a liminal position. You know, the whole idea is that they'll appear with scourges and sickles and torches, um, largely at the behest of women, or which in- includes uh, female witches, uh, anyone who's been wronged or is seeking to exact revenge uh, over the course of an opera mask or a, uh, a piece of theatre. Um, so in Dido and Aeneas, the Furies don't actually have a physical role in the uh, witches. I would say the best way I can describe it is not really revenge. It's uh, as Dido seems to have done nothing to provoke the witches' uh, displeasure. But uh, the Furies don't actually come into into physical play there, but they remain symbolic um, of the witches' hatred and the strength of that, their intent uh, to enact that hatred on Dido. Um, and also we have a number of interesting, uh, there's a, quite an interesting uh, note in one of the manuscripts regarding Dido and Aeneas um, that's something I have that unfortunately hasn't been, I haven't found it replicated uh, as it stands at the time uh, in the 17th century we didn't have a tradition of printed music in the same way that we do now um, so as far as Dido and Aeneas goes there is no original and definitive score um, we don't have a copy that's written in Purcell's hand there weren't you know there wasn't one that was printed um, very little is actually known about the original performance of the opera um, so what we currently have of the opera and of its score has been reconstructed from a number of manuscripts so um, one of these uh, the Tenbury manuscript um, which is a handwritten hand copied manuscript has a um a reference references the Furies, but there is a an existing copy of a libretto from what is believed to be the first performance of Dido and Aeneas in uh, Josiah Priest's boarding school in Chelsea. Um, in that was in we believe in sixteen eighty nine. Uh, that has a note that refers to enchantresses and fairies. Um, now, admittedly, the reference to fairies. This reference to fairies is the only one that it has. It wasn't reproduced in later copying of the manuscript and is largely ignored in modern performances of the work. But nonetheless, it's quite an interesting note. Um, another quite notable appearance happens in the uh, third act uh, and also is written in that uh, libretto from the has the direction that Jack of the Lantern leads Spaniards out of their way among the enchantresses. And um, we can presume that the Spaniards that are referenced in this, at this point, we have had a host of sailors and uh, Aeneas's men uh, just perform a musical number about how they're going to weigh anchor and leave uh, leave Carthage um, prior to the witches appearing on stage. So what's quite interesting to me with regard to Dido and Aeneas is that the witches rarely if at all in terms of the opera as it's written occupy the same space as any mortal character so rather than sharing a space or being perceived by Dido and Aeneas at any point the witches appear in self-contained scenes and only have dealings with themselves or with other other beings that could be perceived as supernatural so if it's the case that's the furies or if it's the spirits that they're summoning or their interactions amongst themselves uh, or alternatively performed with a chorus who maybe appear on stage or off um, 
but they they're not they're at, at any point in the uh, opera or in any of the original librettos they don't actually share the stage uh, with the titular characters and this figure of Jack of the Lantern that uh, parades the Spaniard's path is um, quite a pertinent one it's another reference to folklore so the character of Jack of the Lantern was one uh, who of course the seasonal decorations take their name from uh, was the ghost of a person who had moved a landmark and was doomed to carry heavy stones of the afterlife. And the appearance in the opera, particularly at this point when the supernatural space that the witches occupy intersects with the human space occupied by these sailors is of quite a remarkable significance. A figure who's primarily associated with boundary keeping and with the protection of boundaries, the fact that the only intersection between the human world and the supernatural world inhabited by the witches, um, this jack-o'-lantern figure embodies the very boundary between the supernatural and natural space on stage and is in, in a way a visual signifier of the relationship between the two, which is quite a liminal one. Now, admittedly, the references to this reference to Jack O' Lantern, um, so far exists uh, that I have been able to find. The only the only record of it is within that Chelsea libretto. It's not been replicated in the later uh, later copies of the manuscript that we have. It didn't appear in the Tenbury manuscript or any of the following. Um, as large, it's one that's largely overlooked. It hasn't been one that seems to have made it into print any modern editions but it is one that I think would be quite it would be quite interesting to observe on stage and I think the fact that it is there is quite uh, is quite important it's very interesting actually this this idea of um the liminal boundaries in the staging because obviously um liminal boundaries themselves are are an area of folklore which come up quite often uh, we see it in um locations like crossroads for example we see it with trees and things like this often where these these liminal boundaries are important we see it in the weather as well the times at dusk and dawn um being liminal times so are we seeing a similar sort of thing when we look at something like the witches themselves, for example? Are they being portrayed on stage in a way that we would expect them to be from the folklore record of the time, or is there something different about them? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, as you say, um, the folklore is largely preoccupied with the notion of liminal space, and I think that the, con- the conflation of folklore and liminal space is something that's very, very ingrained in, um, in the British and, and the Irish psyche, to be honest, as well. Um, this witchcraft in itself is something that crosses boundaries of religion and folk tradition um, right, you know, right into politics. And so I think really witchcraft in the period and or at least the existence uh, of witchcraft in British society at that time was some, in some something of a, a conflict with the prevailing philosophical and theological ideologies and it, of course you had a criminalization um, between uh, at this point in, within religion of this notion of witchcraft as being uh, associated with um, you know kind of malign intent um, but it is quite true that the uh, folk magic traditions during the period retained um, more of a semblance of kind of a pre-Christian system of morality that um, as um, we know from uh, examining like cunning folk and things like that, it could be used. It's not necessarily a force that's uh, negative. It's magic is more regarded, or what was seen as magic was regarded as something of a neutral force that could be deployed um, for good or ill. So, given that Christian ideology viewed it as its viewed magic as its own polar opposite, um, I think it's quite interesting how this is then depicted on stage. So. The as we've seen, or pardon me, as uh, as I'm sure you know from previous guests and from and as I'm sure your listeners know uh, from their own knowledge of witchcraft, um, images of witches during the 17th were uh, largely coloured by um, the witch trials going on in Europe, which uh, in turn kind of perpetuated the image of the witch as morally deficient. Uh, which in turn was seen to lead to attributions of physical deformities. You had things like um, witch marks or this notion of 
at this you no, know, it's still very very uh, this kind of hunched um, hunched figure. I mean, one, I think one of the most uh, famous examples would be to think of the Wicked Witches of the West. You know, the kind of warty face, green skin, um, a physicality that is coloured by this notion of magic as evil and tainting. Um, while in reality, uh, what that work may have been perceived at the time as witch marks could have just been simply biological irregularities, things such as moles um, or disfigurations that could have been associated with diseases. Um, in the eyes of religion, these were moral corruptions that were so made manifest in the corruption of the body. So marking if, for example, you know, the, the notion of man as made in the image of God, a witch being a deformed being, you know, in, in con- an evil figure, uh, could there would therefore be deformed. So this notion of the witch as something that's dehumanized uh, through these associations of magic as something that's inherently evil is quite key to understanding the position of the witch on stage during the period and particularly within Biodon Aeneas. So, as I've said before, in addition to any kind of moral status or physical attributes, the humanity of the witch within the confines of the opera is quite questionable. So, as I've mentioned, the witches that we see in Dido and Aeneas engage with demons, they engage with spirits, um, and it's from these figures that their magic seems to stem. And in doing so, the witch interacts with that that's not, it's not mortal, it's not of this world. Um, and as such is, in a way, tainted by association. And this, of course, isn't any kind of value judgment on any actual witches of the period. This is with, purely within the confines of the opera. So the witch in within Dido and Aeneas, by interacting with, as I've mentioned, these figures, the Furies, her spirit, with this Jack of the Lantern figure, becomes more... Than human, but retains their physical, the this, this physical aspect of being human. So there's something that's quite liminal. They're not quite human, but they're not quite inhuman. They're the way they are depicted flies in the face of nature, um, or at least in the face of this um, post-pagan philosophy that we had of uh, this kind of Christian moral polarity. Um, and even in like as we see, even in the folk magic tradition. Um, where we see that figures who have, you know, figures of cunning men or cunning women who are attributed to powers, powers that are more than human, um, which may have been regarded as divine gifts or learned skills or products of nature. Um, the witch, in the case of Dido and Aeneas, uh, is the result of this perceived lack of humanity and that lack um can't be contained within a moral polar system um, since they're not human and since they're not inhuman they occupy a space that cannot be comprehended something and they really they are the embodiment of this notion of the fear of the unknown of the uncanny they're familiar in that they seem human but they engage with the supernatural which is something beyond the human realm so as a result the witch doesn't actually belong in a human space on stage in Dido and Aeneas, they occupy a space that reflects this complicated position. Um, so, as I've mentioned, the witch, as, as she stage during the period, was something of a creature of its own conception. It wasn't necessarily one that was founded purely in folklore, but more in the dialogue between different folkloric and literary traditions. So, um, there were instances of you have a mask, you might have the appearance of which in anti-masks um, that would precede a mask as a kind of moral counterpoint. Um, early modern periods saw witches occur as characters in various various dramatic enterprises, so um, quite a few of which re- reflected the notion of the witch as something that was deformed. So, um, of course, the best known of these is the Weird Sisters in Macbeth, in which of course, Macbeth articulates the view that the witches are deficient uh, by referring to them as the imperfect speakers, um, which in itself is a reflection on the witch as some, in some way deficient or disfigured. Um, this slur 
as it is doesn't necessarily apply to their appearance, but it could also be a well. It, it may be a case, and as they are often depicted in being uh, somewhat horrendous to behold, um, it may have reference to the notion of the witch as being being possessed of some kind of spiritual imbalance. So it's kind of a case where they can only share the stage with that which is like them. So in the case of the witches, it's the sorceress summons uh, her wayward sisters to join her and so she can occupy the stage alongside uh, other witches. Um, but short of that, there's very little intersection between the two. So the sorceress in Dido Linnaeus is, you know, she's quite in terms of she, her being the kind of primary magical character that we see is um, she's somewhat resigned into as to having a quite a limited uh, circle of interaction in the opera. It can only be her fellow witches or her magical subordinates. So as I've mentioned, I've mentioned the Tenbury manuscript a number of times. That's uh, the Oxford Tenbury manuscript. Um, it's non-specific about who exactly comprises the witches' chorus because the witches are a number uh, of the songs or performances that the witches do during the um, during the course of the opera are accompanied by choruses to some quite spectacular effects um, used with the fantastic uh, voice writing by Gertzel. Um So it's not quite... The Tenbury manuscript doesn't specify um, what characters comprise this chorus, but the libretto from Priest's uh, boarding school includes the direction for drunken sailors at one point, and... It's not quite sure whether or not these are intended to form chorus because it doesn't exactly provide much of an instruction for that. Um, But the specificity of the fact that they're drunk uh, offers some explanation as to why they can inhabit this liminal when the intersection of the human world and the supernatural world occurred. It was only in the case that the human was in some way... Um, and I'll use inverted commas here, out of their mind. So in case that was something of me- melancholy, some kind of grief or anguish, uh, or in a drunken state in which the mind was altered, these drunken sailors, while drunk, they become irrational and capable of communication with the supernatural. I, I do believe it's something that's very much linked to, um, as you said yourself, those kind of the, fo- the, the folkloric liminal spaces. I think it's something that is embodied in quite an interesting way by and I, I, something I, I really think is to the credit of both person and Tate it's a very nuanced depiction now admittedly how these operas are staged um, there we have no way of knowing exactly how it was staged in person and Tate's time so it's fully possible that on stage they may have shared spaces but in terms of how it's laid out in the surviving manuscripts that we have and in the libretto there are very clear boundaries set between where the witches appear and where where humans appear um and as i say now in in the 21st century how those things are staged are of course down to they're of course down to uh directors and stage managers and to the dramatic companies themselves these are of course any it's not a case of saying that you should one should stick exactly to what's written on the page absolutely not but it is nonetheless quite interesting to examine those boundaries as they appear in these manuscripts from the 17th century because i feel they are quite uh, they are quite they're for one thing they're quite interesting but i do feel that that uh, those divisions are something they are they do signify something yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, and staging will change over time in the same way as anything else changes over time. And of course, um, you know, these representations within folklore change over time as well. And it's all part of this cultural shift and the way that things change and develop, I guess. So, so uh, it's... Yeah, I mean, and, and it's natural. It's a natural course of events to take, isn't it? Um, we're going to have to wrap up in just a second. At this point, I would love to be able to say to people, let's have a listen to part of this. But I can't do that because this particular opera is still under copyright. So I'm not allowed to play um, part of the opera on the show for, for copyright reasons. So... Finally, if people do want to have a listen to this and and to tie this in with your work and your research and what we've been talking about, where's the best place for them to be able to go to do that? 
Um, in terms of, well, I'd say if you have the opportunity to go and see a uh, production of Diamond on AS Live, I would in- entirely encourage you to do so. Um, as far as recordings go, my own personal favourite is the St. James Singers and Baroque Players recording, with, uh, which is conducted by Ivor Bolton. Um, that's, you can get that, I think it's a Teldec recording. Um, in terms of if you're interested in looking at scores, I would go to uh, the Purcell Society of a fabulous edition that's very closely based uh, of the Tenbury Manuscript. And uh, as far as I'm aware, that edition also has a copy, a, uh, a series of images uh, of the... Uh, libretto from the Chelsea School. Um, I mean, if anyone is interested in having a look uh, at any of my research, um, I'd more than encourage them to get in contact. Um, they can do so, I'm sure, if they'd like to, if you'd like to attach my email or Twitter or anything like that to to the page or have those details there. They can find me on Twitter. It's at Alice apparently and the tagline is Opera Witch. Um, but yeah, I'm more than happy to share any research that I've done with that. It's a, a field that, to be honest, I feel has, there's not a huge amount of research that's been done and it's something that I feel really should be done. Um, so yeah. Absolutely. You're quite right. And um, I will put links to uh, all of your contact details on the guests page on our website so if you want to get in touch with Shauna and to talk about this some more uh, do visit the guest page on the website and do so as a very niche area of research and one that I hope will inspire people to look into this a little bit further and to yes uh, to contact you and to talk about it and to look into these relationships so thank you Shauna for sharing a little bit of your work with us on the podcast My thanks go to Shauna for talking to me about her fascinating research into the folklore of the supernatural from a different and oblique approach. If you want to find out more about Shauna's work or discuss any of the themes which she referred to, please visit the guest page on the podcast website at www.thefolklorepodcast.com where you will find links to contact her. Thanks for listening. See you next time. The Folklore Podcast is created and hosted by me, Mark Norman. Find out more about my writing and research at www.facebook.com slash marknormanfolklore. The Folklore Podcast art director is Melissa Martell. Find her work at www.mdmcreate.com. The Folklore Podcast will always be free to listen to, but it is an enormous amount of work to research, create, record and write two of these episodes every month. And so we have created a simple way in which you can help to support the ongoing life of the Folklore Podcast. Please visit our website at www.thefolklorepodcast.com and click on support. There are various ways that you can help, and they don't all involve giving us money. Even just leaving a simple review on iTunes or other podcast apps helps to grow our audience. So please do visit and take a moment to help us to keep going. Thank you for listening. The Folklore Podcast theme music is written and performed by Gurdy Bird. <laughs>